Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's Wednesday webinar, Introduction to AWS. We're so grateful that you've decided to spend this hour with us. We know you've got a lot going on, so thank you so much for being here. And I'm also thrilled that this was such a popular topic. Um, we had a lot of people register, and I see people are still coming in fast and furious. And big thanks to our presenter, Miles Brown. Uh, he's my colleague and uh, one of our top AWS instructors. And we will start here just in a moment. I uh, just wanted to let you know, though, that this session is being recorded. We'll put this up on our Accelerate YouTube channel, and it will also be available at, Excel, at accelerate.com slash library slash videos. We, we have all of our previous webinars up there, too, and any upcoming webinars if you want to check them out and sign up for those as well. And just to tell you a little bit about Accelerate, my name is Anne. I've been with Accelerate for 11 years. But we've been in business for 19 years and we deliver a lot of private customized training all over the US worldwide and now of course online so like everyone else we've shifted to online training and actually it's been really great for a lot of our clients because now we can do the schedule on their timeline sometimes people want half day classes or just classes on Tuesday and Thursday so we can work with you to do that. Um, you might know that we teach AWS, but we also teach a lot of other classes, other cloud classes. We also teach um, programming languages, data science, JavaScript libraries, Microsoft tools, and a lot more. But today we're here to talk about AWS. And if you go to our site and look at accelerate.com slash AWS dash training, you'll see a couple dozen classes there, um, but we can always customize the class for you if you don't see the perfect one. And one of Miles' many superpowers is that he can, um, if you get him on a call and you want your class customized, he can kind of focus in on what you're looking for and then say, oh, let's take some modules from this class or a day from that class and then put it all together and make you the perfect class. Um, Miles is also an AWS consultant and a trainer, so he's not just teaching this, he's actually living it. Um, he's also an AWS authorized instructor champion, Google Cloud Platform instructor with over 20 years of experience in this industry. And he works with one of our most important training uh, partners, and we love working with them. Um, and Miles is a really dynamic uh, trainer who knows his stuff, but I'm going to let I'm going to let you see that. So, Miles, I'm going to go ahead and hand this over to you. All right. Okay. And, and you're seeing my agenda now? Yep. Perfect. Okay. Thanks. All right. Thanks for that lovely introduction, Ann. Um, my name is Miles Brown. I've been an AWS instructor, like an authorized AWS instructor, uh, coming up on seven years. I, I've I've been using AWS for a little over 10 years. And um, what we're here to talk about today is just sort of, you know, get you the big picture. Why do we, why do people use the cloud and in particular AWS? What are the main benefits? Uh, sort of a quick intro to the main foundational services. I'll do a quick launch of an EC2, uh, uh, like a virtual machine, uh, just with a little web app running in it. And then we'll finish off talking a little bit about some of the authorized AWS uh, training curriculum, because that's what we're talking about here. It's, it's actual authorized AWS content built by AWS, delivered by instructors that they certify. And, um, you know, that makes a big difference between, you know, there's, there's a lot of options out there and some of them people built them five years ago and AWS is such a moving target. Things change weekly. Uh, and so having the power of that curriculum team at AWS updating the, the courses, you know, in, in a uh, con continuous manner re really makes a big difference. Uh, I'll have time for questions at the end, but if you have questions along the way, there is a questions box that you can put them in. And uh, I'll probably just answer them verbally as we go along. And if there's some that I want to, you know, maybe wait on, I'll, I'll wait and, and cover them at the end. But uh, let's jump straight in. And I want to start with just some basic definitions because, you know, the, the audience for this may not have much cloud experience at all. So when we talk about cloud computing, what we're really talking about is this idea where we have on-demand access to a shared pool of configurable computing resources, right? So we're talking about uh, virtual machines for the most part, right? In, in the old, old days, you know, when I graduated from college, um, 
you know, if you wanted five servers, you went and bought five physical machines, you know, and chances of all five servers running at a high utilization at any time, pretty low, right? But uh, the biggest change in the late 90s into the early 2000s was uh, virtualization. So VMware came out and changed how people ran data centers. And the idea was if I wanted 10 web servers, I didn't have to have 10 physical machines. Right? And I, I could have fewer, larger machines, and then I could stack up lots of virtual machines inside of them. And that really set the tone for the idea of public cloud, where you just take it to the next logical conclu conclusion and say, does every one of these organizations have to run their own data centers? Or can we just rent, you know, by the hour or maybe by the minute or by the second, depending how the billing works, uh, rent access to these virtual machines? And so that's really where AWS came out back in 2006. Uh, and then Microsoft Azure and Google Cloud came out in 2010, 2011, you know, respectively. And so that, that really started to change quickly how things happen. And so part of the big idea of cloud computing is that these, uh, these resources can be rapidly provisioned and released with minimal management effort or service provider interaction. So everything we do in AWS is an API call. And so once we've got our privileges and everything set up properly, I can just say, hey, go launch a virtual machine. And when I'm done with it, I say, stop it, right? And I pay for the time that it's running and I get access to it. Nobody else has access, including people at Amazon. They can't get into that machine. So I'll launch either a Linux or a Windows machine. If it's Windows, you know, I, I can remote desktop into it, but nobody at Amazon can. If it's Linux, I can SSH into it, right? And so this is sort of, you know, the big idea. So when we talk about the the, you know, the configurable computing resources. What kinds of things are we talking about? I mentioned virtual machines. Well, that's compute. But basically anything you can think of in a uh, on-premises data center, we have sort of an equivalent in the cloud. So, so, you know, we're not gonna have physical servers, but we're gonna have access to virtual machines. We're not gonna have physical networks, switches and routers and all that, but we will have this idea of software-defined networking where we set up our own networks and decide what kind of traffic is allowed where. Um, we've got all kinds of storage, we'll see. Uh, databases, application services, we've got different ways to deploy things. And so, you know, there are basically, you know, not exactly one-to-one, -one, but there are equivalents of whatever you need in a data center in the cloud. And um, the biggest benefits that come out of this are, are well, we're gonna take a look at them. So if you think about, if you're going to set up your own um, uh, data center, you know, first off, there's a huge capital expenditure where you, you know, either buy a building or lease a building, you know, get some land, build a building, you know, uh, and then buy a bunch of physical machines and rack them and stack them and all that kind of stuff, right? So it's huge initial purchases. And then you've got all the labor to just physically plug things in and if some physical machine's broken, you got to fix it. And then, you know, there's upgrade cycles. So eventually that hardware becomes old. You got to get new hardware. In the cloud, you don't do any of that. There's no upfront investment. I just set up an account. You know, I need a valid credit card, an email address, and give them a password. And I'm in business. And I can say, launch a virtual machine, right? Just like that. And what do I do? I pay for how long that machine runs. Right, So it's more of a pay-as-you-go kind of idea. And so even if you weren't to save money, this idea of trading CapEx for OpEx is very attractive to the CFO. Right, So a lot of times the pressure to move to the cloud comes from you know, the executive saying, I heard we can save a lot of money going to the cloud. Right? Or at least instead of tying up all our capital building uh, these data centers and populating them with machines, I'm just going to pay a monthly bill. Right? Now, typically that monthly bill will go up over time because you know you start to use the cloud more. You know nobody has less data than they used to have, right? All these IT needs grow over time, but but still it's it's sort of a you know you're really just paying for what you use. And so you know in the end we're we're trading capex for opex, so that's kind of a big deal. Another thing to consider is you know those physical machines that you have in your data center. There's a lot of basic system administration that has to happen both physically maintaining the servers, but also a lot of operating system stuff that you have to do, a lot of Linux boxes, probably a lot of Linux administration. And it turns out that if we start using managed services and things like that, 
in AWS, we can really cut down on the amount of that. And in the end, you, you know, what you're focusing on is not building and running data centers. You're focusing on what do my applications need to do, right? And so, you know, again, the big, the big idea there is you stop spending your time on the things that are not your core business. Why does every one of us have to be an expert in Linux administration and servers and, and everything else? Uh, oh, I've lost my, okay. Um, but, uh, you know, back to that saving money idea, right? Because that's, that's a big one. Um, you know, when we buy a bunch of hardware, you're buying for a fixed capacity. So you kind of have to like look into the crystal ball and say, okay, when are we going to be busiest in our IT group? And how how busy is our peak? And then we'll go buy physical machines to handle that peak. So say you're like, a, uh, I don't know, some kind of commercial web app and you're selling products on the, online, you think, well, okay, probably, I don't know, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, you know, sometime in November, we're gonna be at our busiest. So we have to go buy a bunch of equipment, procure it, set it up with enough capacity to handle that peak, right? And uh, what happens most of the time, we're not at the peak, so we're, we got all these machines, they're probably plugged in, uh, sucking power, heating up our data center, so we gotta pay to cool it down, right? So there's some real costs there. Uh, in the cloud, we we have very flexible capacity, right? When we're busy, we'll launch more stuff and we'll pay for it only when we're busy. When we're not busy, we'll turn it off, right? And uh, this idea that we can launch things quickly, we can turn them off quickly, means that, you know, we we uh, if we make mistakes, which happens, right? You, you look at this application, you think, okay, this is gonna be um, really CPU intensive. We're doing a lot of uh, cycles and stuff. So I'm gonna buy machines with a lot of compute relative to how much memory they have. And then you find in practice, uh-oh, there's actually, it's kind of a memory hog, this app. And you say, well, we bought machines that look like this, but I wish we had bought these other machines. You're kind of stuck with it. Like maybe you can add some memory to those machines, but only up to a point. Whereas in the cloud, if you don't like what you launched, you just turn it off and stop paying and launch something else. And so it gives us that agility, right? And, and what we find is when, when the cost of failure is low, this really engenders this sort of culture of innovation where your IT group gets really agile. You can try things out. You can try new technologies pretty easily. So we get some real benefits from that. And then finally, when you build a data center, you're building you know, maybe one data center and you say, well, if we have some extreme high availability needs, we might build another data center far, far away. But that's really expensive and it takes a lot of work to set up these things. Whereas in, in the cloud, we have these 25 regions around the world that you can use right out of the box. And so they make high availability really easy and actually pretty cheap to a certain degree. And um, you know what you find is that high availability isn't just for the most mission critical apps. We can make all of our apps take advantage of this global infrastructure. Now, a little bit about that flexible capacity. I kind of mentioned that most people's IT needs grow over time, right? Like I said, you, you, know, you have more IT than you used to have. You have more data than you used to have, right? Um, it, it's not a linear, you know, kind of growth like that, but, you know, uh, in traditional kind of hardware, you're buying a bunch of hardware and then once, you know, that hardware gets old or we're near capacity, we buy another big chunk, right? So, so we're doing large capital expenditures. But like I said, we don't have a linear graph like this. Your actual demand is going to look something crazy like this, where over time it trends higher, but you've got busy times and less busy times, right? And so there's sort of two things that end up happening. One is, you know, you bought a whole bunch of machines that aren't needed right now. And so you've tied up a lot of capital. You're probably paying to power them and cool them and all that. Um, so that's money that you don't need to be spending that you are. The bigger problem is when we're over here where, you know, we've got more demand than we can actually handle right now and customers are going to feel that pain. And so the idea in the cloud is that we can elastically grow or shrink, you know, a cluster of machines so that we can very closely meet our actual demand with our provision capacity. And that's where the real savings come from. 
and and we're talking about not just on a like a month over month basis we're talking within a within a day you've got a web app it might be really busy in the middle of the day and almost nobody in it in the middle of the night well then we can grow and shrink you know on that demand uh, a little bit of other cloud terminology that I want to get out of the way. You sometimes see these acronyms, uh, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service. Sometimes people call that PaaS and software as a service. If we, uh, if we consider something like, um, let's say running a database, like say you got an Oracle database, right? Um, in an on-premise data center, you're kind of in charge of everything, right? You got to set up the network, you got these racks of servers, and then you put the uh, servers in them. And then you got to set up storage. You got to think about virtualization, installing operating systems, whatever the database or whatever is on top of that, right? There's a lot of stuff that you need to do. And you're managing it all yourself. When you go to infrastructure as a service, basically what you're getting is a virtual machine from your cloud vendor. So in AWS, we call it EC2. Now, actually, in, uh, in Azure, they just call them VMs. And in and, and Google Cloud, they call them VM instances as well. So, I mean, that's what it is, it's just a virtual machine. We call them EC2, we'll see why. Um, and so basically Amazon takes care of everything up to it, including the installation of the OS, and then you gotta manage the OS and install whatever on top. So you get a virtual machine and you don't think about the physical machine underneath, right? So that lets you kind of manage everything the way you've always managed it. it it's a double-edged sword, right? You get a machine, you get to do whatever you want on it, but you also have to maintain whatever you put on there. Right? The next level up is what they call platform as a service, where they say, well, you know what? Everybody that's running an Oracle database, we could do that for you. Right? So why don't you let us take care of the virtual machines and the operating system and the file system and installing and patching the database, and then we'll just give you access to that database. You know? That's what you call platform as a service, and there's lots of platforms, including relational databases that you can get from your cloud vendor. In fact, these are the two sort of, you know, main focuses of most of the cloud vendors is infrastructure as a service and platform as a service. Software as a service, you probably think of something like salesforce.com, right? That's software as a service or Gmail or uh, Office 365. Those are our software as a service where basically it's just an app that you use. You know, you can maybe customize what it looks like a little bit, but the data, everything is all owned and stored somewhere else. Um, and that's what the public cloud providers, they really focus on infrastructure and platform as a service. Although even AWS has some software as a service, they've got WorkMail and WorkDocs. This is a little bit like Gmail and, uh, you know, uh, a secure kind of document sharing and, and quick sites like, um, it's a BI tool, business intelligence tool, looks a little bit like Tableau. Right, so they have a few of those, but that's not their bread and butter. Right? But the, the best example of a platform as a service is the one I just mentioned, the uh, the RDS, the Relational Database Service. So you know, this is an alternative to just saying I'm going to launch a Linux instance, manage Linux, install my database, and manage it. Right? Amazon says, why don't you let us do that for you? We'll provide a managed relational database, and there are up to six different engines that they can support for you. Right? But it's a big trade-off. You're saying, I'm no longer the DBA. I'm letting a brainless algorithm at Amazon be my DBA. Is that a good trade-off? For some people, it sounds great. Other people say, no thanks. Right? Because in the end, you know, the idea is you get a JDBC or an ODBC connection, you connect to that database, but you no longer have to worry about virtual machines, operating system, file systems. You don't worry about patching the operating system or the database. Right? You, you don't spend time on undifferentiated heavy lifting. This is a term, you know, the, the CTO, the chief technical officer of amazon.com is this guy, Werner Vogels. He comes up with a lot of uh, sayings and he called that undifferentiated heavy lifting. It's the same work that everybody has to do to get say an Oracle database running. Uh, it doesn't make my organization any different than yours. So why are we doing this? Why don't we let the cloud vendor do that? And so, you know, that picture of, hey, this is everything you'd have to do if you were running an Oracle database in your own data center. And if we move to the infrastructure as a service, well then Amazon's doing all of the basic hardware stuff up to the installation of the OS. It's up to me to patch it and install the database and all that. Well, when we move from, from infrastructure as a service to platform as a service, 
We're just saying, let's let AWS take care of all this. All I do is connect and say, what do my tables look like? And I can control where the indexes are and the partitioning and stuff. But they're going to do everything. They'll take automatic backups. I can come in and say, hey, I want to do a manual backup whenever I want. But you know, for the most part, the the heavy lifting DBA tasks are all done for me. So that's a perfect example of a platform as a service. Now, um, probably the newest model that some people call it FAS, I, I don't know, you don't hear people say FAS too often, but this concept of function as a service, where, where you say, I'm a developer, I don't wanna think about virtual machines, I don't even wanna think about Linux or Windows or any of that. I have some code and I wanna provide that code and it's in, a, in an event-driven programming model where I say, run this code when this event occurs. And then that's it, I don't wanna think about anything else. In AWS, we have a service called AWS Lambda. And so this is serverless compute. So you provide the code, configure the event that triggers it, and I don't think about servers, operating systems, high availability, deployment. And I don't pay for virtual machines that are sitting idle. I pay in one millisecond increments for how long the function actually runs. Now, Microsoft Azure and Google Cloud, they have similar kinds of what they call cloud functions or Azure functions. Um, but Lambda is, is, you know, it's been around for a while and it's very mature and they keep adding more features to it and different languages you could use. And, um, you know, there's a lot of different kinds of triggers that can fire like, hey, whenever somebody uploads a file into this, uh, you know, cloud storage, that's an event, go and run this code. Yeah. And I could, if I wanted, in these days of microservices where you take your big application, you blow it up into a bunch of little little pieces, I could implement each piece as a Lambda function if I want. And so this is sort of really taking off. This is sort of the sexiest thing in the cloud these days is, is what they call serverless, right? And so you could implement your business logic as a series of these little Lambda functions, put that behind this sort of uh, API gateway that basically says, hey, if, uh, if a, an HTTP request comes in, for this URL and a get, call that Lambda function. For this URL and a put, call that Lambda function. And then the Lambda functions, when they wanna to talk to a database, they're not talking to a virtual machine that I manage, they're talking to some sort of managed database like RDS or maybe a NoSQL database. And so you look through the whole stack and you're like, where's Windows and Linux? It's gone, right? It's only in whatever the client is. And so it's a very interesting idea and uh, it's really starting to take off. Now, this isn't how most people start their journey to AWS, right? Most people start by saying, let's take some existing apps and do what we call the lift and shift, where we say, okay, let's take exactly that and let's launch virtual machines in the cloud that look just like the machines we were running. And, and we'll, we'll do our sort of, put our toes into the cloud just to try it out, right? Uh, and then over time, you start to think about well, how do we optimize for the cloud? How can we really take advantage of all the benefits and all these sort of managed services where I'm not managing the individual virtual machines? Now, uh, a little note before we before we get in and talk about all the rest of the uh, services, let's talk a little bit about the global infrastructure. So uh, AWS has infrastructure around the world, right? They start with the data center. Typically when they build a data center, they're usually not even just building one, they're building a couple, you know, maybe five, six, whatever, right beside each other, right? Um, that cluster of data centers they call an availability zone or AZ. They're close enough together that they look like one data center, right? And then what they do is they say, a few miles away, they'll build another cluster of data centers, right? And so they'll build two or more of these availability zones, usually three or more, uh, and each one, you know, typically it'll be like, okay, in this town, they've got uh, an availability zone. And then three towns over, they've got another availability zone. You know, they've got, they've got the miles apart. Close enough together that they can put some very high throughput, you know, low latency lines between them. But far enough apart that if there's some sort of localized disaster that takes out this one or, or this cluster of data centers, it doesn't affect the other one miles away. And, and that group of two or more AZs, they call a region. And so AWS currently has 25 regions around the world with 80 availability zones. And so this map sort of shows you, I think I put the link there, so it'll take me to the actual, here's the map. 
So you see the regions around the world, they've got some more coming soon. You know, um, in North America, we've got seven. Now, there's one in Canada and six in the US. Now, AWS didn't always have all these. You know, they started in Northern Virginia. That's the biggest and largest. It's actually got six availability zones, not that you would ever use more than two, but um, you know, they just had to keep adding, you know, more clusters of data centers in different towns um, just to keep up with the demand. So they started over there and then they added one uh, over here in, uh, in on the West Coast and then Europe and then Asia Pacific somewhere, you know. And at first it was just about uh, latency, you know. If you've got a web app that's very popular in Asia, you know, you don't really want to run your resources in Northern Virginia, right? Because you know, there's a lot of latency going around the world with every web request, right? But, um, you know, over time, people started to say, well, not just latency, what about data sovereignty laws? You know, at one point, uh, Amazon was talking to some big German companies and they said, we love AWS, we would use it more, but we have some laws that say certain kind of financial data has to be stored in Germany. And at that point, there was only one region in Europe and that was in, in Dublin, Ireland. They said, we can't run certain workloads. And AWS said, well, if we built a region in Frankfurt, you know, would you use more AWS? And they said, yeah, Volk. And so they did, right? And so this started this sort of country specific explosion. But even in the US, we've got six regions, right? So it's East Coast, West Coast, but it's more than that. Uh, there's some special ones. So they've got something called the GovCloud. There's one in the West and, and one in the East as well. And these ones are special. You can't just use them out of the box. You have to fill out a form. They do a background check to make sure you're either a US citizen or a green card holder. Um, and the services, it, not every service is in every region. Those ones, only the services that have been heavily vetted for certain kinds of compliance. Like if you need to do ITAR compliance or uh, you know, Department of Defense stuff or FedRAMP, you know, then you're gonna wanna run those workloads there. The two in China are similar where they have to do a background check saying how and why are you doing business in China. So other than those four regions, the other 21, you can use right out of the box, right? So as soon as I go and set up an account, which I mentioned earlier, you just need a, a valid credit card, an email address, and give them a password. Now you can log into the management console. And here I see that I'm in Oregon, but I can flip to any of these other regions. Right? And uh, this is what the management console looks like. It's a little daunting. You know, you look at this and you see, you know, 200 plus services, you're like, wow, this is a lot to learn. Don't worry about it, right? You don't need to know all of them. There's a lot of really weird niche stuff. You know, Ground Station is a service for communicating with satellites. RoboMaker is for uh, deploying intelligent robotics applications. You know, like I never use those and I'm probably never going to use those, right? But there are about 20 services that kind of everybody uses. And so that's what you really need to learn. Right. And then just get a 30,000 foot view of the others, just so you know, hey, I, I don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's already a, a nice managed service that does something for me. The most fundamental of all these services is EC2. Okay. It stands for Elastic Compute Cloud. Not that that helps. It's virtual machines in the cloud. Right. And so when you click on one of those services, it takes you to a management console just for that service. So I'm going to come back to this after after we talk a little bit about the, uh, you know, these these various um, foundational services. So we're gonna get started with AWS. You need to know a little bit about foundational services. When it comes to compute, the two main ways we do compute is give me a virtual machine and I'll run whatever I want on it and I'll manage it myself. Or there's the serverless. To be honest, the third model is if you do uh, containerized workloads. So you're using Docker or some other container like that. Uh, we have a couple of different options, ECS and EKS that help with those. But that's sort of another type of compute. Okay? Um, but EC2 stands for Elastic Compute Cloud, and that's you know, the idea of virtual machines. When it comes to networking, uh, we have something called the VPC, the Virtual Private Cloud. And that is our main uh, uh, construct when you say, I need to set up a network in which I'm going to launch my EC2 instances, right? Um, VPC wasn't there initially. When, when EC2 first came out way back in 2006, they basically said, do you want a public IP address or not? You know, when you launched a server, you decided 
hey, if it was a web server or something that the internet needed to find, you said, yes, give me a public ID. If it wasn't, you said no, right? And that was fine for a while until people started to say, well, I am in this hybrid environment. You know, a lot of organizations, most organizations are in a hybrid environment where they have some of their own data centers and st some stuff running in the cloud. And they said, well, I wanna be able to talk to my stuff in the cloud from my own data center, but I don't necessarily wanna open it up to anybody on the internet. So is there a way that I could set up like a VPN between my own data center and the cloud and talk to my stuff without making it available to everybody? They said, well, we could do a VPN, but here's the problem. Right now, you you know, back then, you weren't in charge of what's the private IP addresses of these virtual machines you launched. And so we might have conflict with the IP addresses in your own data center. So they said, what if we gave you, you know, your own slice of Amazon's network and you could set up your own cloud in there? It's a virtual private cloud where you're in charge of all the IP addressing. You tell me what's the range of IP addresses. And what that really did was it 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 gave you know us as customers our own network people were overjoyed they said okay you know we have some ip addressing scheme like everything in this data center the ip address is 10.1 dot something dot something everything in this one it's 10.2 dot something dot something so when i set up that cloud I, everything's going to be 10.3 dot something dot something right now i can connect them and then I can take that network and I can slice it up into subnets and decide what kind of traffic's allowed in and out of each of these. Some of the subnets might be public, so they have access to the internet to talk to them and some things could be private. And so that's the big idea behind VPC. Now, a lot of times what people are launching is a bunch of app servers or a bunch of web servers and you're gonna put them behind a load balancer. Well, you know, in your own data center, a load balancer could be a physical device or it could be a piece of software, right? Well, of course, in the cloud, everything's software-defined network. So we use software load balancers. So I could launch one or more EC2 instances and install whatever software-based load balancer we want to say, hey, I want to open these ports and allow this kind of traffic. And and then, you know, when the traffic hits my load balancer, it it spreads it across multiple, you know, different servers. Or you could use this nice elastic load balancing service so that I don't have to think about the EC2 instances and installing them and patching them and installing a software load balancer and patching that. It's just a nice, easy to use service out of the box. Uh, when it comes to storage, we've got a lot of options. Right? When you launch a physical server, you, know, you, you, you say, okay, here's a physical server in my data center. It might have disk on it. Right? When you launch virtual machines on it, you know, if the virtual machines have access to that local disk, that's really fast, right? There's no network involved or anything. They can talk really quickly. Well, same thing here. Depending on the EC2 instance type you launch, it may come with some direct attached storage, but it's not persistent. Anything that decouples my virtual machine from that physical server, so if I stop it or terminate it or shut it down, all of a sudden what happens to that disk? It's gone. So it's what we like to call ephemeral storage like, ooh, gone, like a ghost. And so our other main type of disk storage is called EBS, the elastic block storage, where you say, hey, I want to go and provision a one terabyte drive and attach it to this EC2 instance. And so while it's attached to that instance, I can use it, it looks like local disk, actually under the covers, it's actually network attached, but it looks like local disk, but I could detach it from this instance and attach it to a different instance if I want, but it's regular disk drive type stuff. Right? Then we have a very strange kind of idea. There's no real equivalent to S3 in your own data center. It's shared storage, but it's not like a network file system or anything like that. S3 is what we call object storage. So it's just binary large objects, blobs. You can throw any kind of file you want into S3. The way we access it is Anyone anywhere in the right in the world with the right permissions, they come in through HTTP or HTTPS, and they do puts and gets, you know, and deletes. Um, it doesn't sound like something you might use a lot, but it turns out S3 is very durable. It's very cheap. Um, they're not going to lose your objects, and they can hold any kind of object. So it ends up being really handy for backups, 
for dropping, like I just drop log files into this S3 bucket all day. And then every night I have a Hadoop job that says, grab those and go do some analysis on them. You know, S3 ends up being really the backbone of all data life cycles in, uh, in AWS. Whether you got big data stuff that you do or just log files, even just any database or anything that you have that needs a backup, that's where you're probably gonna put it. And so it ends up actually being kind of an important piece. And so if you take, take like a regular three-day AWS class, you're probably gonna start pretty early on talking about S3. All right, um, just the last couple uh, things here. Um, you know, everything we do in AWS is an API call. So we really have to control who can do what with the API. And that's what IAM is all about. It's, it's identity and access management. You set up users, put them into groups, dole out permissions to them. Uh, when it comes to uh, encrypting data at rest, right, we have a nice KMS, the key management service, where, um, you know, we can we can get a nice audit trail of what are the keys that were be being used to encrypt the data and, and where did they get rotated, how often, all that kind of thing. It's really good for compliance that you need. Uh, we talked about RDS at length already, uh, the Relational Database Service, which is a PaaS for relational databases. We have many NoSQL options. Probably the biggest one is DynamoDB. It's a fully managed NoSQL database. You, you want to get ready and get started using DynamoDB. What do you do? You come in, you say, create table. Here's the name. What's the primary key look like? It's up and running. You know, I remember 10, 11 years ago, I read an article on MongoDB. You know, NoSQL databases were kind of new at the time. Um, and, uh, and I remember the... Um, I had an application and this company I was at at the time was very, uh, we, we mostly use MySQL databases for everything. And I said, I wonder if this app would be better with MongoDB, but I just read one article on it. And so I said, I want to try it out. You know, talk to my boss and said, okay, well, I need, uh, I need like a cluster of Linux machines. And at that company, it was like pulling teeth to just get three Linux boxes together. And then as a developer, I still had to go in learn how to install and configure MongoDB and set it up on a cluster. It was a lot of work just to get to the test. You know, Nowadays, in the cloud, I could easily just launch three servers and play with it and get rid of them when I, if it work, doesn't work. You know, uh, But DynamoDB says, don't even worry about that. You come in, you tell it, here's a table name. Here's what the primary key looks like. We're up and running. I can try it. I don't like it. Shut it down. So one of the one of the big benefits that they don't talk about a lot when you when you take a, like an AWS class and they say here's the big benefits right they they sort of concentrate on the saving money and then the the agility but it sort of democratizes new technologies if you want to try something out there's not such a barrier to entry to do it oh I had a question here um, which one of the storage is uh, used most um, yeah if we go back to the storage I mean EBS and S3 are both used very heavily, but EBS volumes, if you want to take a point in time backup, well, where's that going? That's going into S3. So everybody who uses EBS also uses S3. So in the end, S3 does get used by pretty much anybody who uses AWS. All right, good question. All right, it's probably time to, to do a little bit of a demo. So let's let me launch an EC2 instance and then we'll uh, we'll just finish up with uh, talking about the you know the, the courses and see see where to learn more. Um, so I'm just here. Uh, I was in the EC2 dashboard, and you can see. Well, there's no instances running, right? I can fix that quickly. Here's a big button that says Launch Instance. Okay. Well, if I want to launch a virtual machine, the first thing I have to start with is, well, what's the template? What's installed when this thing comes up? And so AWS has something called AMIs, an Amazon Machine Image, and you get them from lots of places. You can build your own AMIs but there's a bunch of what they call quick start ones, which are sort of a bare, bo bare bones, really just an operating system usually that Amazon builds. So they've got Amazon Linux, excuse me, very new. They have some, some Mac OS ones, but they're super expensive. You don't want to touch them. Then different flavors of Linux. So Red Hat, Suzy, Ubuntu, and then various flavors of Windows. So Windows Server 2019, 2016, so on and so on. So I'm just going to launch Amazon Linux. It's really just they forked off of Red Hat. It's the cheapest option. 
So I'm going to pick Amazon Linux. Now, step two is choose an instance type. So this is almost like if you were going to buy hardware. It's a trade-off of cost versus how much CPU, how much RAM, what kind of networking capabilities, how much storage do they come with. Now, they don't show you the price on here. you got to look on a separate page for that, but they show you everything else. These instance types are grouped into families. So here's the T2 family, which has different sizes from the Nano up to the 2XL. The 2XL has eight virtual CPU and 32 gig of RAM, which is roughly double what the 2XL has, which is roughly double what the large has, right? So, so within a family, there's different sizes. So we got the T2 and T3 families. You know, there's a T1 out there, but you know, that you'd have to go look at the old generations. Typically, you're using the latest stuff if you can. Um, now, the names, they, I don't know exactly what the T, those are burstable ones. Uh, if you know that you have certain kinds of workloads and you say, well, I need relatively more compute than RAM, then you might look at the C4 or C5 family. They are heavy with compute. Or maybe it's the other way around. I need a lot of memory. So you go find the M5 family that has lots of RAM. Right. They actually have some really crazy high RAM ones. Like if you go look at the X1Es, X, they're alphabetical here. The X1E 32XL, it comes with four terabytes of RAM. Not four gig of RAM, four terabytes of RAM. Think about that. That's a monster machine. Right? Uh, this would cost you a million dollars to go buy a physical machine like that. Now, these are not cheap. Right? You're going to pay something like 26 bucks an hour for this. But the idea is, you know, we got all these different kinds with all these different facilities. You should be able to figure out exactly what you need for your workload. So they start from the T2 Nano that comes with half a gig of RAM all the way up to the one with four terabytes of RAM. Now, this one probably costs about half a cent an hour. That other one is 26 bucks an hour. Right? So you got to figure out what you need. So I'm just going to pick the T2 Micro. It's free tier eligible. So for the first year of your account, they've got certain things that they'll give you for free. For EC2, they'll give you 750 hours a month of either Linux or Windows, but only on a T2 Micro, which is kind of a small machine. It's not really good enough for a lot of uh, production workloads. It's for learning, for proof of concept type stuff. Next, it says, okay, well, how many do you want to run? Where do you want to run them? Now, the nice thing is, if you don't know anything about networking, when you first get started, there's already a default VPC set up. It's set up just so that you can launch stuff without ever thinking about networking. And then what they do is they make four, they make uh, a public subnet in each AZ. So here, US West 2B. So US West 2, that's the name of a region. That's the, the region in Oregon, right? And then the availability zones are A, B, C, D within that. So I don't really care where it runs. Now, um, you know, there's all kinds of things. I'm not going to get into all of it. But one of the things we can do is we can say, well, when this instance first comes up, I want to run a script. Right? Like we call this sometimes a bootstrap script. Right? Um, if you don't, well, then you'd probably have to like open up SSH and then you'd have to remote into that machine and run a script. But if I know that I want to run a script, I can come in here and I can say hash bang. So if it's a Linux box, you have to, that's what you do. And you say, okay, I'm going to go set up a bash script. And what am I going to do? I'm going to do a yum install of the HTTP daemon. So I'm just going to go and download from the internet the, uh, uh, the Apache web server. And then I'm going to say service HTTP daemon start. Now, this is about the most minimal um, uh, this is about the most minimal web server. You know, normally you would go and you'd maybe download from somewhere uh, a zip file and then uh, unzip it and change the permissions and everything. This is just going to have whatever the static page that says, "Congrats, you got a Apache web server up and running." All right. Next, you can add storage. You know, they're going to use a little eight gig EBS volume but I could add other volumes if I want. And the uh, last main step, they say add tags. Uh, tags are case sensitive key value pairs. They're sort of meaningless unless you give them some meaning. Now they suggest you add a name tag. 
So here I'll call this uh, uh, web server one, right? If you don't give it a name, then all you get is a big, ugly, cryptic ID. And if you've got 20 of these running, you don't know which one's which, right? So we use tags for things like name, but also maybe, you know, hey, what department is this for? This is for the training department, you know? Um, we can use them for identification. We can use them for maybe billing purposes, right? At the end of the month, you normally get a bill and it just says, here's how much you owe for EC2. Well, I could go build, make a billing report that says, show me how much I owe by department. Right? So they give you up to 50 tags and people use lots of tags to, to, you know, within your organization, it's a good idea to come up with what are the mandatory tags? What are the optional tags that we use? You know, uh, The last main step here is to configure a security group. A security group is essentially a set of firewall rules. It's a software firewall. Whenever I launch an instance, I have to launch it into at least one security group. Now, typically, you know, some other networking person will create it and you'll go find the web server security group or something like that. But if I have to build my own, I can. Here, uh, security groups by default don't allow any inbound traffic. So you have to go and say explicitly, what ports do I want to open for what kind of traffic? So they made a guess. They said, you're running a Linux instance. You probably want to open port 22 for SSH so that people can get in. Maybe just from a particular IP address or maybe from a range of IP addresses. You know, when you say anywhere, they're like, that's kind of a problem. You don't want anybody to be able to SSH in. Well, first off, they need to have the private key, which they won't have. So it's not as bad as it looks. Now, I am going to add a rule for HTTP. Uh, from anywhere. That makes sense. I want anybody to be able to get in and probably HTTPS. Wherever that's gotten to, HTTP, HTTPS. How come I don't see it? There it is. It's at port 443 from anywhere. Okay. So if it's a web server, I usually open up those two ports. Okay. Review and launch. It says, okay, we're going to launch. Your security group, by the way, is, is open to the world. That's still kind of a warning, right? Um, I'm going to answer that next question in a minute. Okay, so I'm ready to launch. It says, wait, one last thing. We're going to use SSH, but we didn't agree on what keys to use. Now, if I had beforehand created like an, a, a public-private key pair and uploaded the public key to Amazon, then I could say, use that one but I hadn't done it, so I can't choose an existing one. So I'm gonna create a key pair right now. And I'll just call it April 14th KP, just so I remember to get rid of it later. It doesn't let me launch until I download the private part of the key. So they're gonna download into my downloads directory a PEM file. It's really just the private key of an RSA public private key, and we upload the public key. Same thing if I was launching Windows. And what they would do in Windows is they would generate, they would create, when Windows first came up, they would create a user called administrator. They would randomly generate a password and then they would encrypt the password with the public key. So only somebody with the private key, i.e. this guy, could decrypt it and then log in. But here, they're just gonna literally use it as an SSH key. Now I'm not gonna SSH in, so it doesn't matter. All right, it says, okay, it's launching. Let's go view instances. And here I see it is still pending. It takes a couple seconds. It should go from pending to it'll turn green and say running, right? And that means that the uh, virtual machine's up and running. Uh, it usually takes maybe maybe a minute and a half, something like that. So even now it's running, but it's not done, right? Because then that script has to run and go and download the Apache web server from the internet. But uh, you know, I can see various details about it. There's a public and a private IP address and all kinds of details. If I select it, I can see even more details down here at the bottom. Now, uh, you know, there's security details. I can see the security group it was launched into, networking stuff, storage information, status checks, it's still initializing. Uh, monitoring, I can see certain metrics that they gather. Now, it's too early to see any metrics, but things like what, uh, what percentage of CPU is being used. Now, while I'm waiting for this thing to finish, there was a question that said, if you select the instance type and then you realize you need to change or upgrade to a bigger server, how does this work? Well, if you're staying within the same instance family and you're just changing to a different size, a bigger size, it can usually just do that. It just stops and restarts. But if you need to change to a completely different instance type, then usually what you'll do is you'll say, let's take a snapshot of this thing 
and then let's launch a new server based on that snapshot. So whatever was on that root EBS volume will still be there when we bring it back up, but we're launching a new one and terminating the old one. But the nice thing is, as soon as you terminate the old one, you stop paying for it, you know, it's good stuff. All right, well, this thing's ready to go. Uh, here, I've got the IP address. Let's go open that IP address. Oh, a little too soon. It's still initializing. I, I got to give it a little time to finish all that. I'm always a little too impatient. Faster. <laughs> okay. As soon as this thing stops, it'll stop saying initializing. It'll say two out of two checks have passed, which really means that uh, you know it's available, the networking's good, everything's good. So you just have to wait a little bit longer for this thing. I mean, there is a slight chance that I messed up that script that I wrote, <laughs> but I think it's probably just I gotta wait a little longer there. Two or two checks have passed. Try again. Uh oh, my web server doesn't seem to be working. Let me just copy this directly. Public IP address. Is that exactly what we had in here? It does appear. Oh, oh, there. I might have been a caching thing. Okay. So here it is. It says, hey, uh, you got to this page. So apparently, you know, your HTTP server is installed. This is not a very impressive website. Right? It's just one static page, but it's up and running. Uh -huh. And didn't take us too long. It's only wondering on one instance, like later I would probably say, let's make an auto scaling group and run 10 web servers and then decide when we're busy, let's add two more. When we're less busy, let's remove some and we'll put those behind a load balancer. And that's exactly the kind of thing that you'll learn as soon as you take another AWS class. So let's talk a little bit about where to learn more. And we just got a few minutes left here. AWS, oh, well, let's start with certifications, right? There are certifications that are kind of important if you're trying to move up and become an AWS partner, network partner, and, and move up in the ranks there. Uh, originally, AWS just had three, two levels, the associate and the professional level. Uh, they added uh, this cloud practitioner, which is sort of really, really low bar. It just says, do you know how to spell AWS? Congrats, you're certified. It's not all that useful in the industry. Most people who are technical skip right over that and they go for one of these three tracks, right? The architect track is the most popular. Uh, it's the most broad, really. Uh, operations is if you're more of a Linux or Windows or network administrator or something, you might tackle that. The developer class is really for people who are developing applications specifically for the cloud. Talks a lot about the APIs that you use from various languages. All of these um, uh, uh, are sort of multiple choice exams that you can write, but they map to like a three-day class that, that maps to that. Uh, and then there's the professional exams. These are very difficult, right? You better have a few years of AWS experience because they are very difficult. Then they also added the specialty exams. So they're sort of, you know, you, you better know the basics like that associate level and then you can go on and learn more about security or about databases or the analytics stack or machine learning or something like that. The professional and specialty certifications are more difficult to achieve, but they're also highly valued in the industry. Right? I remember the first time I put my professional DevOps engineer into my LinkedIn, I had headhunters you know, knocking on my door the next day. Right? Um, while there's no requirement for an associate cert before attempting one of those advanced ones, you better have that knowledge. And most of the certifications have a course that maps directly to it. Okay? So almost everybody starts with either the technical essentials or the cloud practitioner essentials, like a one day class where you learn about AWS. And uh, if you're going to go on to a technical class, then the tech essentials is a better choice. If you're just trying to achieve that, you know, cloud practitioner, then the CPE is a better course it ties a little closer to that cert. Um, you know, we have our salespeople go and get the cloud practitioner essentials and, you know, it's for managers and people like that. The three main courses are the architecting, the sysops and the developer class. 
and then you've got the follow-ons the devops engineering or the advanced engineering will help you get ready for the professional certs now a long time people were complaining like there's a three-day class architecting and another three-day class for the advanced architecting can you jam those together and it was always difficult because the way they were set up now aws has a five-day architecting on aws accelerator class which is the two of them together if you know a little bit about AWS, you've, you've got maybe the associate architecture and you want to really focus on, um, you know, tracking and cutting costs, you know, so after you've been running in AWS a while, you start looking at your bill and say, how can we save on this? You know, we have the cloud financial management for builders, but it's not just for finance people. It's got to be AWS technical people. Then we've got all the classes that map to those sort of uh, specialty ones. So there's a database class, there's the big data class, which is you know, focuses a lot on Hadoop, running Hadoop in AWS. The data warehousing class is a three-day class on Redshift, which is our data warehousing um, service. There's a nice four-day machine learning class, teaches you the basics of how to be a, a sort of data scientist, and then specifically using the AWS tool set. We got a couple of newer classes, one on Elastic Kubernetes Service. So if you're running containerized workloads, this is the way to do it these days. Uh, we got a nice class on serverless solutions. So really about at Lambda and API Gateway and all that. Again, you would probably take like the architect or the developer class first. If you wanna see more about these, uh, we've got the, uh, the full course catalog and um, you know, here it is on the Accelerate website. So there's the technical essentials, the cloud practitioner, you know, and then we get into the architecting, the developing, and, and all those. Um, so I think that pretty much brings me to the end. So I'm gonna pause there. I think I answered the questions that were in the box already, except the, I can't hear one, but somebody else answered that one, right? Um, yeah. So I'll open it up. We'll be around for a bit. I don't know, Anne, if you had some other uh, wrap-up stuff you wanted to talk about. Yeah, thank you so much, Miles. That was wonderful. And we want to thank everyone, of course, for attending too. Um, really appreciate that you were here. And you know, the reason that we were able to do this webinar is because people requested it. So um, when, we're, when we're done here, when we close out the webinar, you'll be getting a little eval. Let me put my little camera it's weird to like hear a disembodied voice isn't it um <laughs> we'll we'll be sending you a little evaluation and we we do really read them all um i manage our webinars here so if you have any ideas for a webinar that you would like to see you can let us know in that form um also if you have any training needs you can let us know and you know don't worry we're not going to bug you about it <laughs> we just want to know so if you know we can get you on a call with miles if you want customization he he knows all these classes inside and out. He'll be able to help you out with that. Um, so let me just see while if there are any more questions coming in. Oh, yep. Yeah. You know what? I'll be quiet right now because it looks like you have a couple. Oh, I, I answered the one. Um, this one about the, for if you're a technical project manager, then I, I would definitely consider the cloud practitioner essentials. You know, if you're not going to be in there doing AWS stuff all the time, but we're really managing a team, you just need to be able to talk the talk. That's what the cloud practitioner is for. It's like taking this one hour webinar and blowing it out to eight hours and, and really you know, getting into the terminology and understanding you know, what do we want to do with AWS. So um, that would be the right one if you're more of a project manager, I would say. Great, okay. Uh... Yeah. And uh, like Ann mentioned, if, if you've got very specific needs, you know, um, uh, talk to Accelerate, get me on a call. You know, I, I spend a lot of my time, I don't actually teach every week now. I, I'm doing more customer calls because our sales reps are sort of, you know, they only know so much technically. And at some point they're going to get out of their depth where I need to come in and talk to the technical people and find out mm -hmm. what's the exact mix we need. And so we can get on a call, we can figure out, does one of these canned classes, is it a good starting point? And then can we pull some other stuff in? Um, and so we do a lot of that kind of thing. Um, if if you're, you know, the, the classes, I would say their number one goal is to teach you AWS and the AWS services. 
uh, number two goal is to get you ready for exams. Like they are not teaching the exam exactly, right? Um, and so sometimes we can do like a, a three-day architecting class and then add an extra half day that's just around exam prep. Um, so to really get you ready for it, you know. Uh, so we, we've got various things that we can do like that. If, if you get on a call, we can really sort it out. Yeah, you can let us know in the eval or you can just um, drop us an email at info at accelerate.com or just visit our website. You'll see where to contact us. So anyway, you know where to find us. Um, and uh, yeah, if we can get Miles and, and your team on a call, we can hash that all out for you. Yep. So just let us know. And um, yeah, I think that's all I'm seeing for questions now. I have about two o'clock on the dot. How did you do that, Miles? I, I, I don't know. It just always seems to work out. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, um, let me let everyone go. But you know, if you've got any other questions, you can always email info at accelerate.com and I can get that over to Miles. But um, I guess for now, everyone enjoy the rest of your day or your evening, depending on where you're, you're uh, joining us from. But um, again, Miles, thank you so much for doing this. We all, we all really appreciate it. No problem. All right. All right. Good luck, Thanks, everybody. everyone. Have a great day. Bye bye.